Hello and welcome to lecture 17 of the course Microelectronics Lab. In this module, uh, we will give you a laboratory demo of deep level transient spectroscopy. After giving you a brief overview of DLTS or D deep level transient spectroscopy, we will give you a description and the explanation of the hardware setup, different modules involved in that. We will talk about procedures of sample loading. Uh, description of measurement flow will explain you how the measurement is conducted. Uh, we'll then switch to the software which is involved in uh, doing the measurement and the analysis. Uh, we'll also try to understand uh, the, the DLTS measurement parameters and how to set it. Then DLTS data acquisition, analysis and simulation. And finally, key measurement concerns in DLTS that one should uh, take care before starting the measurements. Hello and welcome everyone to this session on deep level transient spectroscopy setup. As the semiconductor technology advances, devices with novel architectures based on next generation beyond silicon materials such as gallium nitride which is a wide band gap semiconductor, graphene which is a 2D semiconductor, they are gaining prominence. The key factor that determines the wide scale employability of these devices is reliability. And in determining how reliable these devices are, traps, that is energy levels in forbidden gaps, play a very important role. Traps, in traps or defects in devices make them unreliable. They cause instabilities such as threshold voltage instabilities, on current reduction, transfer characteristics, hysteresis and current fluctuations. Since among the various defect levels that can be present in the mid gap, the deep levels, the energy levels that is greater than 3 kT from the conduction or valence band, they play an important role because they cannot be excited under normal conditions. However, if they are excited and if they trap carriers, then detrapping would take time of the order of 10 to the power 3, 10 to the power 5 seconds. Given the important role of deep level traps in determining reliability of semiconductor devices, it is necessary to characterize them accurately and efficiently. In this lab, we use a setup called deep level transient spectroscopy setup, which has the following key capabilities. The DLTS setup can measure current voltage, capacitance voltage, capacitance frequency characteristics over a wide range of temperatures from 77 Kelvin achieved using liquid nitrogen to temperatures as high as 600 Kelvin. This tool can ac also access frequencies as low as 20 hertz to 100 kilohertz, which can therefore probe slower traps as well as faster traps. We use various measurement modules such as capacitance DLTS, current DLTS, optical DLTS to characterize traps and the key parameters of traps that are characterized are trap concentration, the spatial location of this trap that is where it is present the energetic location, the energy level, and the capture cross-section of the traps. Using the IVT characteristics, we also find out or explore the various current conduction mechanisms in the devices. The device structures that are used are MOS cap, that is metal oxide semiconductor capacitive structures, or short key or PN junction diodes. The key components of the DLTS setup include the cryostat chamber, which is used to control temperatures. We have the sample loading stage, which is loaded inside the cryostats chamber, which has probe positioners, tungsten probe tips, and also we can load wire bonded samples. We have a control unit, which comprises of electrical source measure unit. We have a pressure gauge, we have a temperature controller. And in order to maintain vacuums as low as a milliliter, we use a turbo pump and a diaphragm pump combination using which we can achieve vacuums as less as low as less than 10 millitors. This is the DLTS setup control unit. The pressure gauge monitoring the chamber pressure can be found here. After loading the sample we must ensure that the, the chamber pressure is less than 10 millitors which is ensured using the, uh, the turbo diaphragm pump combination that we have. The temperature controller present here is used to control the temperature while it is ranging from while it scans from 77 Kelvin to temperatures as high as 800 Kelvin. The 
The temperature controller is a PID controller. The PID controller ensures that there are no overshoots or undershoots in temperature and the temperature is stable while measurement goes on. The PID controller has thermocouple and temperature controller gauge connected to the stage through which it controls the temperature. We also see the source measure unit which has two components. One is for electrical supply to the device under test which is given by these two BNC connectors. This can source, current, uh, source voltages up to plus minus 10 volts and can measure currents as low as a few picoamperes to a maxi maximum of 45 milliamps. For optical excitation based measurements, we have power supply to the LEDs which are also given by BNC connectors from here to the chamber. Unlike normal CV IV meters, this source measure unit can measure fast capacitance transient which is at the heart of DLTS measurements where we work on the transients that we measure. This fast capacitance uh, meter can measure capacitance in time intervals of less than 0.1 milliseconds. Further, the data analysis is done by the central processing unit housed at the bottom of this control unit. So now as the sample is loaded and all the electrical connections to the chamber are made, we will use this program called the semitroll characterization program set to, to check whether the device has been probed or not. This is a program package which has CV profiling measurement unit, it has an IV, IVT measurement unit, DLTS, IDLTS unit and other utilities. So first before beginning any capacitance transient or current transient measurements, we will check whether the contact to the device has been established or not. So the first measurement that one does is the IV, IVT, current voltage measurements. So as you can see in this IV, IVT tab, there are there is something called IV, IVT data acquisition, IV data simulation, IVT data analysis for fixed temperature, Arrhenius analysis and IVT analysis in fixed voltages. So the left side tabs are for acquisition simulation whereas right side is for data analysis. So for the time being to check whether device connection has been established or not, we will go to IVT data acquisition. So in the current voltage temperature data acquisition module, we will first check normal IV under room temperature. So the parameters to be noted are starting voltage, ending voltage, the delay, volta delay time before starting the measurement that is the time for which the SMU will apply the starting voltage and wait for the device to stabilize. Then we have the incremental step in the negative voltage regime for v which is given by VINCR1, incremental steps in the positive voltage regime from 0 to ending voltage in these steps. We can also select wide range of integration times. For fast measurements, we will select short. For the normal time scale measurements, we will select medium. And if we are looking at lower, lower currents where noise can creep into the measurements, we will use long sensitive mode. Along with these, we can we could also require giving optical excitations. For that, we will use the current, we will use this current to feed, uh, fed to the LED as the factor for controlling LED intensity. And the total time that we allot for this measurement is given by this time unit. So first we start the normal IV measurement by giving a lower voltage range from minus 1 volts to 1 volts. We start with a lower voltage range because we are not sure of the polarity of the diode that we have connected. In order to check that, we start with a very small voltage range where we ensure that the diode is not significantly forward biased or the diode is not significantly reverse biased to, uh, to avoid large current through the devices. So I am applying minus 1 volts as starting voltage, 1 volts as the ending voltage. I am keeping the step voltages as 0 0.01 volts and we will select IV for the normal room temperature IV measurements and click start. As you can see, this is the status bar showing that the measurement is going on. We are currently in the reverse bias regime of the diode and we are slowly sweeping the voltage from minus 1 towards 0 and then we will go into the forward bias. Okay. So the IV measurement is complete and we see distinct regimes, the reverse bias regime 
and we see the current increasing from around 0.2 volts and it increases up to since as, as I have mentioned that this SMU can measure up to 45 milliamps you can see that the measurement has stopped once we reach 45 milliamps which is at around 0.87 volts. This shows that our device is properly connected and probed and we are ready for DLTS measurements. The second key step for DLTS measurement is to do a capacitance voltage measurement. Okay, now that we have checked the current voltage characteristics at room temperature, we want to check the capacitance voltage characteristics of the diode structure probed in the room temperature. For that, we go to the CV profile tab and we click on this CV profile. So you can see there are multiple tabs, CV data acquisition, CV doping profile and built-in potential calculator, CV depletion width and capacitance versus voltage coordinator graph. So first we will go to the data acquisition tab. In the data acquisition tab, we have, we have to mention the starting voltage, the stopping voltage, number of measurements taken at a particular voltage, that should be increased. Let's set it as 5. Let's set the stopping voltage as at 0 0.87 point, let's start with 0.5 where we expect the diode to be significantly forward bias. The step voltages, there, so you can select the step voltage here. Here there are two modes of selecting step voltages. One is uniform depletion width mode and another is uniform voltage steps mode. In uniform depletion width mode, this, the number of steps is calculated as we know that W is related to square root of V. So accordingly the number of steps are calculated. But for the time being we will start with uniform voltage mode where steps of the mentioned voltage will be taken while CV measurements. This is the AC signal superimposed on the DC bias. The frequency and the amp amplitude is mentioned here. The frequency we can select as 50 kilohertz, it's fine. We can, the, the range that we can access is from 10 hertz to 150 kilohertz. Then just below the frequency button is the AC signal amplitude button mentioned as VAC DUT. So the AC signal amplitude is important we have to uh, because we uh, we have to apply a very high okay after setting the frequency of the AC signal we will set the amplitude of the AC signal the amplitude of the AC signal should not be kept very low because if we keep very low AC signal amplitude then the signal to noise ratio would degrade however we should not keep it very high also because that might also di uh, disturb the DC bias next is we have to select the equivalent circuit mode in which the capacitance meter will detect the capacitance. So there are two modes, parallel mode and series mode. Generally series mode is done when significant amount of current flows through the device structure and parallel mode is done when the device offers high impedance. So let us begin with parallel mode. The CV graph is shown in the right hand side screen. To monitor whether the how good the capacitor is, we can we can also monitor another parameter along with the capacitance. That is, we can monitor phase, we can monitor resistance as well as the conductance. So let's start with phase. And let's click on start button. So from the IV characteristics, it was noticed that, temp uh, that the voltages less than 0 volts were biasing the diode in reverse bias. So we are seeing that as we are going from negative towards 0 volts, the capacitance is rising. That means the depletion width is shrinking. As we are approaching the forward bias, two important things can be noted. First, that the capacitance rises very fast. Secondly, that the, the, the phase angle, which is an indicator of how good the capacitor is, starts from around minus 90 degrees for reverse bias which shows that it is almost close to an idle capacitor but as we cross 0 volts and go towards the cutting voltage we see that the phase angle significantly reduces from 90 and goes towards 0. If we go to a higher stop voltage then we can clearly see this effect. Let us go to 0.8 volts. 
which would significantly forward bias the device. Okay, one can notice a significant drop in the phase angle to as close as 0 degrees when we reach around 0.8 volts, which is in agreement with the fact that huge current is flowing through the device. Now that we have seen that the IV characteristics and the CV characteristics of the devices are excellent, let us now move forward to understand the basic principles of deep level transient spectroscopy measurement. In these measurements, our goal it is to probe traps. So for that, we have to ensure that we are properly setting the initial conditions for the traps and then, the, then we are allowing the trap population to evolve. So first what we do is that there are two types of electrical biases that we apply. One is called the filling pulse and another is called the measuring pulse. The work of the filling pulse is to the work of the filling pulse is to ensure that the traps in the, in the bulk of the semiconductor up to a particular region are completely filled. Then we go to something called the measuring pulse which, in which we observe changes in the population of the trap in terms of capacitance, in terms of current or in terms of, uh, terms of charge fluctuations. So these observations recorded over time is that is the transient which we will be analyzing further to understand the emission rate, the trap concentration, etc. Given this basic understanding of the important parameters for DLTS, let us quickly look into an example of how DLTS measurements are done. First of all, let us bias the diode to zero, uh, under zero bias. We see in this device, in this energy band diagram, that there is a residual built-in band bending because of the metal semiconductor junction and almost all the traps up very close up to the junctions are filled because the traps are below the Fermi level. So this is the work of the filling pulse because it has filled, it ensures that all the traps are filled up in up to the junction. Now given these traps are filled up and we have equilibrium in place, we then pulse the device to a reverse bias. In the reverse bias, what happens is, in response to a negative voltage, the depletion width immediately expands. Let us say the de depletion width expands up to a point A. The moment depletion width expands, there is a strong band bending because this region has to sustain this voltage. And as a result of this band bending, these energy levels cross the Fermi level. And the moment they cross Fermi levels, these filled traps cannot remain filled anymore. They have to now emit these trapped electrons. Now what happens when these trapped electrons are emitted? First of all, before emitting, we, we note that the depletion region is extended longer. And now when these traps are getting emitted, these electrons are getting emitted from these traps, they are leaving behind positive charges. What happens is, to sustain this reverse bias, if we needed a longer depletion region, now that these electrons have been emitted, we are having, we now have larger number of positive charges which are left behind by these emitted electrons and therefore no more we, we, we no more need this long depletion region. So what will happen is the diode depletion region will start shrinking as these electrons are going out and leaving behind positive charges. And we see that the depletion region shifts from point A to point B. Now what is the consequence of, of this shift in depletion region? The consequence of this shift in depletion region can be noticed if we monitor capacitance. So if, if someone looks at the capacitance versus time graph, the capacitance transient, if you look at point B, point B is the starting point when we have immediately applied reverse bias, when the depletion region was long. And as the traps emit, the depletion region collapses towards and it goes, shrinks and comes near to the junction. As a result, the capacitance increases from point B to point C. Our job is to study this transient and from this transient, we, are, we have to extract time constants from the 
the amount of change we can extract trap concentration capture cross sections etc so now as we understand what dlts measurement means we have to first identify these voltages like we have to select a proper filling pulse we have to select a proper reverse bias why the filling pulse determines how much a particular trap uh, uh, up to what extent spatially a trap would be filled a higher filling pulse ensures that traps very up to very close to the junction would be filled whereas a lower filling pulse would ensure that lots of traps are not filled secondly the filling pulse width the filling pulse width is important because it ensures that whether we are giving sufficient time to fill up all the traps if you are not giving sufficient time then the traps won't be saturated and the response will not be strong so we have to ensure that all the traps are filled up the third parameter is the reverse bias reverse bias is very important because it determines to what extent or how far from the junction i am probing a higher reverse bias means my depletion region has gone up to a long distance away from the junction that means that we will be able to probe trap parameters over a wide region of the semiconductor the next important parameter is measurement time and number of transient averages that we take this is important because the larger measurement time would allow the transients to settle down and we can then easily fit in various exponential graphs uh, exponential curves whenever necessary and increasing the averages means larger averages would mean a better signal to noise ratio the next variable in these measurements is temperature temperature is an important factor because of the processes that i have shown here i'll quickly revert back to that slide so so in this slide we see that while we are applying reverse bias the electrons or the holes or the trapped charges would emit temperature is the key source of energy which governs the rate of emission so if there are deep traps then we have to go to higher temperatures to excite these electrons or holes and therefore we have to judiciously select the temperature range so now that we have now that we understand these four important variables governing the dlts measurement let us go to the dlts measurement module so with this basic understanding of dlts measurement let us go towards get uh, acquiring actual measurement data so the first step is to select this dlts tab inside the dlts tab we have all the acquisition tabs present on the left and all the analysis and simulation tabs present to the right so let's start with this dlts data acquisition tab as discussed we have to fill up these parameters called the measurement voltage filling voltage pulse width sample period number of points etc so let's start with filling up the measurement voltage so before we fill up the measurement voltage one important point has to be noted we must select a reverse bias which does not cause a current greater than around 10 microamps or so because if if current during these measurements are high then the emission characteristics would be corrupted by a competing capture characteristics so to before we select the measurement voltage let us first check that how much is the current when we apply higher reverse bias we see that the current is not quite high even at minus 5 volts let us go to a more negative voltage let us say up to minus 10 volts which is the max let uh, max let's go to minus 9 volts and see if the current is high or not
we see that the current is significantly lower, it's around 9.3 picoamps. So, so any voltages from minus from 0 to minus 9 can be used depending on how what is the spatial depth you want to access. Okay, with these numbers, let us go to the DLTS module. Let us apply a measurement voltage of say minus 6 volts and filling pulse. The filling pulse should be such that we have collapsed the depletion region as much as possible. The depletion region is pushed towards the junction as much as possible. So we saw that around 0.8 volts, uh, 0.8 volts the capacitance was quite high and the, the phase angle was towards 0. So let us apply something called uh, something around 0.7 volts. Okay. Let us select a pulse width for the filling pulse to be around 1E minus 3. We will have to check the dependence of this pulse width on how good the signal comes. This is a sample period that is in a transient. What is the delta T step in which the system acquires the capacitance transients? The number of points to be collected is noted here. So we can make it larger to get a better Arrhenius plot. Number of averages we would want in per temperature step is given by this. That is for, a, for one condition it will take 20 runs and average and give the transient. The test frequency and the AC signal f applied to the DUT was already set during the capacitance measurements and let's follow this number which is 50 kilohertz and 100 milli uh, volts. So let us click on, so since, so there are two modules, uh, two, uh, two buttons, one is DLTS, one is setup. Setup is used to, to tune these parameters in room temperature. And on what criteria will be tuned, we will see once we start the measurement. We notice a signal of capacitance, that is the moment reverse bias starts, the capacitance is lower and then the capacitance increases. As we have just discussed in the presentation slide, we see this trend. So what will we, like how will we tune these numbers, measurement voltage, filling pulse width, etc. is the, the, the key is to look in, look at this number called the amplitude, which is in arbitrary units. So let us see if our filling pulse width is sufficient or not. Let us, that is, let us see if all the traps were saturated during the filling phase. So how do we do that? Let us change this number to 5e minus 3. That is for 5 milliseconds, let us apply the forward bias pulse. If we see there is a significant change in amplitude, that means in under the previous condition, all the traps were not filled up and there was more room to fill up the traps. Okay, so we see that the pulse width, when we increased it from 1 milliseconds to 5 milliseconds, the amplitude remained similar. Let us try to increase it to a further higher value and let us see whether it improves or not or if it remains constant. So we have made it 10 milliseconds and let us look at the amplitude. So we, we see that the amplitude is decreasing. So let us go back to our initial number which is 1e minus 3. Huh, the, the amplitude is now better. So let us keep it, let us keep this pulse width fixed because we saw that the amplitude is higher for lower pulse widths. Let us also try to increase the number of averages, although that would increase the measurement time and let us see if the amplitude improves or not. The amplitude has improved a very little, so there, there is not much an e effect of this number of averages. Let us also check if the filling voltage improves the amplitude. We must ensure that we are not allowing significant amount of currents. 
So let's try with 0.75. Uh, so this has reduced the amplitude. Let us go back to 0 0.7 or even a bit lower. Let's go to 0 0.5 and see. Okay, so this is giving 1.64, but we noted that in 0.7 it was higher. So let's go back to 0 0.7 and check it once again. Okay, so this is no, like if we are keeping it on the lower side, it is not significantly affecting the amplitude. So let's keep it at 0 0.7. Let us also see how the measurement voltage, that is the reverse bias voltage, affects the amplitude. Let us go to a bit higher reverse bias, let's say to minus 9 and see how effective it is. So this has improved the signal to 1.99 e minus 4. So let us work with these numbers. Now the next thing is to set the temperature of the measurement. So in order to set temperatures, we have to pro uh, pour in li liquid nitrogen, which will allow us to scan temperatures from 77 kelvins to and heat up using this temperature controller up to 600 kelvin. So we saw the DLTS uh, parameter settings. One more important piece of information is how, uh, to understand how we f uh, choose these parameters. So although we have discussed the key points in choosing these parameters, there is one, one module in the CV profile unit which will also help us in this decision making. So, so in the CV profile we saw CV data acquisition. So we now go to this doping profile and built-in potential calculator. So here based on the CV graph, the diameter of the, the device probe, dielectric constant, temperature, etc., this, soft, this software module generates 1 by C square versus V graph and then from this it calculates carrier concentration versus depletion width. So this is important because this, this data would be used to calculate how much voltage is required to control depletion region. So for example in this right hand side graph you can see voltage versus depletion width graph. It shows that the amount of bias applied and the extent of the depletion region. We can see that for the voltage ranges that we have selected, say we have selected minus 9, minus 9 volts would mean 10 microns, 10.6 microns of depletion region. Whereas in the forward bias, when we are going to 0.7 volts, we can note the cursor numbers here. So the left hand, the left hand number is the x-axis, the right hand number is the y-axis. We can see as we go towards 0, uh, 0 0.5 or 0 0.7 volts, the depletion width has reduced to around 3 microns. So as we go from minus 9 to 0 0.5 volts, we are, con we are moving over a 7 micron range of depletion region. So this would further assist us in choosing the measure voltage and the filling voltage because in the measure voltage we would want the depletion region to be as large as possible. In the filling voltage we would want the depletion region to be as short as possible. So you can note also that once we are entering near the forward bias regime the depletion width shrinks very sharply with the applied bias. So we must ensure that we select a voltage which, which shrinks the depletion region completely. In this case, if we select 0.5 volts, the depletion width has become 0 0.55 microns. So with these numbers in mind, we can now start the DLTS measurement by clicking on the DLTS mode, setting the appropriate temperatures and then filling up liquid nitrogen so that this cryostat can bring down the temperature to a lower value. So for the further DLTS measurements, we will scan the temperature from liquid nitrogen temperature that is 77 Kelvin to higher temperatures maybe around till 400 Kelvins. 
So, to do that we will pour in liquid nitrogen as demonstrated here. So, we remove the knob here and then we put in this funnel through which, which guides the liquid nitrogen down to the cryo chamber. While filling one has to note that when this whole column is filled up, we will see vapors coming out from this tip, from this point. So, we have to note this and we have to pour until and unless this point starts giving out nitrogen vapor. While pouring liquid nitrogen, proper PPE has to be worn as you can see here. You have to wear special gloves, cryo boots and also eye goggles so that there is no splash events. So, when this is coming out, so when this is coming out, this means that the whole column is filled, filled up and we should stop pouring liquid nitrogen and then we must wait until and unless the system stabilizes. After that, we will start with our temperature scans. Before carrying on with the full temperature scan, we will go to a lower temperature and then we will do a temperature at a fixed measurement, fixed temperature we will do a measurement and we will see if the capacitance transient comes out well or not. So, let us go to a temperature around 160 Kelvin, where we expect a certain peak for the, the silicon carbide diode that we have probed and let us, so this is the temperature setting window and then let us start the measurements. So, once we click you see that there is a dialog box is opened which corresponds to the temperature controller. So, this shows the graph of sample temperature collected from the cold head connected to the sample holder versus time. Also the heating and cooling rate can be seen towards the right hand side. Further to control how fast the temperature increases or decreases, there is a table. In this table you can see temperature, step size, gain, stability count, tolerance, integral. So, this means that temperatures for temperatures greater than 10 Kelvin up to 30 Kelvin, the temperature will rise with the following step size of 1 Kelvin. For 30 and 70, it will rise with 2 Kelvin step size. So, for each interval, we can set step sizes. For the time being, let us set these step sizes to 5 Kelvin because we want to reach 160 Kelvin right now and do a transient measurement. So, this tolerance numbers and stability counts are important which allows the device 
to the device temperature to be set at a particular value and the controller waits until and unless the temperature stabilizes because there are chances that there would be overshoots or undershoots and to avoid that we must have this stability count to be significantly higher. The stability count would count for how much time the temperature remains within this tolerance window. If, it, if the count is above 30 or whatever you select it to be, the, it will wait for that count and then the measurements would start. The purpose is to give the system enough time for the temperature to stabilize. After setting this, we click on save settings. We can see uh, that the temperature is falling gradually controlled by the PID controller. So we will wait for the temperature to stabilize to our set point. We can see that the temperature is dropping at a rate of 5.5 Kelvin per minute and it has reached 175 Kelvin and it's, it's reducing further. The temperature controller is also displaying the same. So one more thing to notice is that the, the chamber pressure is well below 10 millitors, it is around 3 millitors. One has to ensure that the chamber pressure before the cooling process starts is below 10 millitors. The cooling process or the DLTS measurements must not be initiated if the chamber pressure is higher. So one can also note that we had set the temperature to 170 Kelvin and this temperature graph has reached 170 Kelvin and it is waiting for the temperature to stabilize. You can see the stability count. The system is waiting for the temperature to be within this window for the given tolerance that we have given for 8, 0.8 Kelvin. So until and unless the temperature enters into the tolerance window of 0.8 Kelvin, the counter will not increase and the measurement will not be taken. So we can note that the temperature has been put into this tolerance window and the stability count is increasing. It will increase up to 30 and then a measurement will be taken. Uh, so it has increased to 30 and we see that there is a measurement going on. Okay, once the data is taken, the system asks us to type in a file name wherein it will save the subsequent transients for each, each and every subsequent temperatures. So we have to type in a name here. So once this is saved, all the subsequent da transient data will be saved in this folder. So once we have reached 170 Kelvins, our job is to optimize the transient that we have got. So at this particular temperature, not only do we optimize the transient room temperature, we have to optimize the transient in the temperature regime where we expect a peak. So we are carrying out the optimization let's say by setting the temperature to minus 6, filling pulse to 0 0.9, 0 0.85 and then repeat this run with an eye on the amplitude. We see that the transient is not proper, so we go to a lower voltage. We go to a further lower voltage. Yeah.
So, what basically we are trying to do is to set these parameters in this temperature such that this amplitude is maximum. So, we see that we are getting good signals with these parameters in place with minus 3.45 volts as measuring measurement voltage, filling voltage of 0.5 volts, pulse width of 1E minus 2 that is 10 milliseconds, 800 points per transient, 20 averages in each, each run and then we set we, we get we are happy with the amplitude and then we set for the final scan from 80 Kelvin to 400 Kelvin. One more important point for capturing good transients is to use this option of deleting start points. So, this means that generally sometimes when, when the device is switching from forward bias to reverse bias there might be very fast transients in the beginning. So, that might suppress your actual signal. So, what you can do for proper analysis is to select the number of points from the beginning that you would want to delete that would suppress this fast transient. However, in some cases the fast transient might be an actual signature. So, how will we understand that? If we see that even after deleting 3 to 5 points this transient is not going on then that means then that means that this transient is actual is an actual signal and we have to live with it. Otherwise, it, if by deleting 2, 3 point it goes, then it would be due to meter overload or some artifact of measurement. Uh, till now, we have seen the parameters that we have optimized for taking DLTS measurements such as voltages, pulse fits, etc. We saw how important it is to optimize parameters in room temperature as well as at lower temperatures. For example, we, we did optimization at temperatures as low as 170, 160 Kelvins. Now, to carry out a full set of exp full measurement from 80 Kelvin to 400 Kelvin. We have set the temperature to 80 Kelvin and we are waiting for the temperature to stabilize. As we wait for this, let us discuss a few more aspects related to the transients, capacitive transients that we record during DLTS. One might notice that we can get capacitance transients as follows as shown here, where the capacitance immediately post switching from forward to reverse bias the capacitance can reduce and stabilize in one case. In the other case the capacitance can start from a lower value and keep on increasing and then stabilize to a higher value. So, what determines how the capacitive transient would look like? If we are probing minority carriers then the capacitive transient would be something of this sort. It would increase from a, it would start from a lower a higher value and then go to a lower value that means the delta C would be negative. However, if we are we are probing majority carriers then we would see the capacitance to increase that is a delta C sign would be positive. So, therefore, it is important to understand this that both the sign changes are valid and both have each meaning ascribed to them. I was also mentioning about the device structures being used. So, we, ha we are using short key junctions, one can also use MOS caps or PN junctions. Short key junctions can efficiently inject majority carriers and therefore, they are used to study majority traps. PN junctions whereas, can in and efficiently inject minority carriers when forward biased. Therefore, PN junctions can be used to study minority traps in a semiconductor sample which cannot be studied by Schottky junctions. Also, in addition to emission processes, one might also be interested to study capture processes happening during filling process. In trap filling process, we saw that the depletion region collapses and the carriers flood in the region and then the empty traps start capturing those carriers. Through DLTS measurements, we can also study the capture of traps wherein again Schottky junction is used to study majority carrier capture and PN junction is used to specially study minority carrier capture. With these information in mind, we will look into a full DLTS scan which is for which we are waiting for the temperature to stabilize and then carry out further analysis. We can notice that the temperature has already reached our region of interest. It is now as low as 86 Kelvin. We will wait for the temperature to further stabilize to 80 Kelvin and then we will start the temperature scan.
you can see that it has entered into that tolerance window and the temperature stability count has started to increase. It will wait up to 30 counts for the temperature to stabilize and then it will start taking transient measurements. Okay, now we have we see that we have reached 80 Kelvin and we have we have started recording the DLT as transients. We will repeat this for multiple temperature steps as we go from 80 Kelvin to higher temperatures and and subsequently all the data will be saved in the file that we enter in the file name section. And once this is done, one, once we record, once the data acquisition is complete and now that we have already learned how to load and carry out DLTS data acquisition, we will now move on to the next section which is data analysis of the DLTS spectrum. Okay, before we start DLT, DLTS analysis, let us go to the main menu of the software. Here we see that we have already done CV profiling we have done IV profiling, we have in the DLTS tab we have already done the data acquisition. Now for analysis we go to the right hand side set of buttons and we click on DLTS data analysis here. So once we click that the data analysis window opens up and here we see multiple tabs, there are six tabs. The first tab is getting data file. So we have we have stored the DLTS transients that we have recorded and we call this data file here and then we go to the first tab which is plot all transients. This is a three dimensional plot which shows capacitance versus time on one axis versus temperature along the other axis. This plot helps us get an understanding as to at which temperature we would expect a DLTS peak to occur. So this three dimensional plot can be rotated to, to get a view of our choice. We can see from here that the DLTS, the, the delta C, the, the y axis here is delta C which is capacitance recorded at two points T1 and T2. The time range can be selected by a window here, uh, by this range bar present in the second row and we see that the delta T is maximum at a temperature of around 170 Kelvin. It decays at higher temperature, it increases, it, it increases at 170 Kelvin and then again decays back to the noise floor at lower temperature. So this capacitance time temperature plot will give an idea as to where we would expect a peak in the rate window. Before we go for further analysis, let us discuss what a rate window is. So now that we saw the temperature and time dependence of the capacitance transients, we will now, before moving on to the further an analysis, we will start, we will try to understand what a rate window is. The concept of rate window is central to this DLTS analysis. From a trap uh, that we are trying to probe, we would expect capacitance spectra, capacitance transient to be temperature sensitive because the, emis the emission rate from these deep traps is a strong function of temperature. This graph shows how temperature governs the transients. When the temperature is quite low, even after switching from forward to reverse bias given by this step edge, we see that the capacitance is not evolving. As the temperature rises, we see that the change in capacitance, expected emission, the change due to emission of, from traps becomes prominent at a particular temperature, it picks at a particular temperature and then it, the, tra the, the transient becomes faster and faster. At higher temperature, this change in depletion region due to emission occurs very fast. Now how do we get meaningful information out of this transient evolution dependent on temperature? To do that, we draw, we take two in time instants T1 and T2 and we calculate capacitance at these two points. Now the act of rate, the, the act of defining a rate window is to determine the maximum change that can happen within this window. So if you select one T1 comma T2, it would, it would act as a detector for a tau equals to 
this ratio of t2 minus t1 by ln t2, t2 by t1. So if you vary t1 and t2, you are basically trying to detect a particular time constant. So you can see that in this rate window, we, are, we have detected a particular time constant given by this expression at a particular temperature T1. Again, if you change this T1, comma T2, you would detect another particular time constant and that peak would be at some other temperature. If you look at this graph below, you see if we change T1 and T2, we are getting shifts in temperatures. So if you change T1, T2, you are, you are changing the tau to be detected, tau is the time constant to be detected and each time constant has a peak temperature. So we get a pair of tau comma t. The next step then would be to have a plot of natural log of tau t square versus 1 by t, which is an Arrhenius kind of plot from the slope of which we can get the, the energy level of the trap. From the intercepts, we can also get capture cross section and by the amount of change in capacitance, the maximum change in capacitance, in, that is the at t equals to immediately after switching and uh, subtract that with the steady state capacitance, you get the value of the number of trap, trap states excited. So we get three things, we get the, the trap concentration, we get capture cross section, we get the trap energy level. The, the trap energy level and capture cross section can be obtained directly from the Arrhenius plot. So in, this, in the software, we are now going to discuss how do we do, do so. Also another important thing to be noted is that why do we use this tool? We use this tool because this tool can detect trap concentrations at least 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5 times lower than the background carrier concentration, which is very hard to detect under normal electrical measurements. So we have again opened this DLTS analysis tab and as we have shown that this three dimensional plot now based on the discussions about how to extract energy level value, trap energy level capture cross section, we now move into the most important part of this analysis is to understand the rate window, plot rate window. So we click on the second tab and here we see some important parameters that has to be tuned. First is T1 index. I was talking about the two, the two sampling times T1 comma T2. So the, the sampling time T1 index is the nth number of samples. So we were taking a large number of points in each transient. So by varying this index, we can take, we can select the first sample to be taken. So let us take a number, say 10. We have to now also determine what will be the value of T2. Generally T2 by T1 ratio is kept constant to generate a good Arrhenius plot. Although other, other relationships can also be taken, but here we are taking a we are, we are following the, the rule where T2 by T1 is a constant ratio. You can select this ratio by this tab, which is showing the T1 multiplier for T2. That means T2 by T1 would be 10. So we have selected the two sampling points T1 comma T2 now. This smoothing order is to smooth the experimental rate window graph that is to be generated. However, we should not, we should not over like overburden this parameter because this might distort the signal. So let us start with a nominal value of 2 and let us click on plot rate window. The act of clicking on plot rate window generates this plot. This plot is in the y axis you can see it is C2 square minus C1 square by C square. So C2 is the capacitance at the time T2. C1 is capacitance at time T1. We calculate square of them and then we take a uh, take the difference and we divide it by the initial capacitance that is C1. And then this, this would therefore, this number would therefore detect for maximum change in capacitance. So that the number would maximize wherever the change is maximum. And the temperature is, um, is as varied, here we have varied from 78 to 80 Kelvin, from 80 Kelvin to around temperatures as high as 497 Kelvin and we detect we see there are peaks and valleys here. So how do we know that these peaks are valid signals or not? First of all, we can look at the amplitude. If the amplitude is very low, then that peak is probably some noise artifact. Also, we have a very useful data here in the left panel. It is the, set, is the steady state capacitance for each transient at a given temperature. 
one must note that if there is any step or discontinuity in this capacitance at lower temperatures which is generally the case it might be because of various reasons first of all the contact to the device is quite unstable at lower temperatures generally also due to lower temperature some a phenomena called carrier freeze out occurs when carrier freeze freeze out occurs there might be a chance that the capacitance is very low beyond the detection limit of the capacitance meter so one must avoid taking doing analysis in those temperature windows and must only do analysis where the capacitance signal is prominent in our case we see the capacitance although decreases at lower temperature but it is it, it, there is no drastic change however the peak that we see here at 170 kelvin is is at a point where there is a, there is a good signal of capacitance and therefore it can be treated as a valid valid signal so now that we see this rate window from this rate window there is another parameter in the at the bottom of this window you can see which is written nsnt ns is the background carrier concentration that is to be determined by the cv analysis that we have done ns and and if ns is 1 and if this is the signal that we have obtained then the nt that is a trap concentration comes out to be 1.7 e minus 4 that means if ns is 10 to the power 16 nt would be of the order of 10 to the power 12 four, to four orders lower so with these observations in mind let us go to the rate window analysis wherein we will vary t1 and t2 to 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 detect def different time constants and to identify at what temperature those time constants are happening So we click on the third tab, we see that there is the this first tab shows plot rate window, we click on this, that brings back our old and for the time being we see there is another option called no deconvolution. So that would mean if, if this peak would have been broad then this could have been fit by multiple Gaussian curves but we find that this is sharp so we can try fitting it without any deconvolution that is with one Gaussian peak. So with this we click on the start rate window analysis plot. We see there is a, pl a plot which has opened up towards the right hand side which is showing show NT NS plot which is again this NT by NS trap concentration by the background carrier concentration. This trap concentration by background carrier concentration plot versus temperature will be plotted as we detect these time constants during the rate window analysis. So the next step is that we can manually look uh, look for multiple rate windows. So once we click on this, let's say we click on this next rate window, you see T1 comma T2 got updated. If you click on another this again, then T1 and T2 gets further updated. So we can do on we can continue doing this manually, and for each click we see there is a red point being generated. So this red point is one particular tau value at a particular temperature. So this red point is reference to the right hand y axis which is tau t square plot and this is 1 by kt. So this red is with respect to the top x axis and the right side y axis. We can do this manually also what we can do we can click on the third button which is step or continuous. Once we do that, that this process repeats for all the peaks that it has and you can see the status bar increasing here. So we see that it generates a pretty good Arrhenius plot. One more thing, here we are getting a peak, we could also have got a valley depending on the type of traps we are probing. So how do we let the software know what to detect? We have this option called peaks and valleys, which we can select for the software to detect a peak or a valley depending on what device structures you are using or what you want to probe. Okay, now that we have generated tau t square versus 1 by kt plot, we will move on to Arrhenius analysis. Why? Because we want to extract trap information such as energy and capture cross section. So to do that, we click on in the, in the, in the bottom half of the software window, there is a button called start Arrhenius analysis. 
you see the moment we click there is a, a, an option called pick points gets enabled this yellow window that you can see would be used to select points and to do RNS analysis we have to select this red points so we click the, we take this yellow detector to a particular red point and click on enter once we click on enter we see that the, the, the in, there is an increment in this point selected counter so we'll continue to do this along the line Okay, so we have covered most of the points associated with this peak and now we click on calculate energy. Before that, before clicking on that, we have to type in the effective mass. Let us type in a typical value, but we would, for, which would be different for each and every material. So with this, we click on calculate energy. So the moment it calculates energy, it's, uh, it asks you to specify a folder wherein it will save these parameters energy and cross section. So you can see in the left hand bottom window, we get parameters 0 0.336 electron volts with an error of 0 0.01 electron volts. The capture cross section is 2.1 E minus 14 centimeter square. And if you want to save the data, then we will have to type in the desired file name. Okay, so now that we have these numbers 0 0.336 and 2.1 e minus 14, we would now like to see if the rate window simulation uh, with rate window simulation capability that whether the extracted parameters generate a peak which fits with the experimental peak to validate whether this process was correct or not. So we go to the next tab. Now that we have looked into the various parts of the control unit of the DLTS setup, we will look into the cryostat stage and the sample holding stage, wherein we will be loading the sample for subsequent DLTS measurements. This is the cryostat stage as you can see taken out from the cryo chamber. So there are multiple components, first the, to the left is from where we will be pouring the liquid nitrogen, this is the indicator for whether the nitrogen has filled up the column. Secondly is this chamber which holds the liquid nitrogen and which cools the sample through a cold head connection here. The temperature is conveyed to the sample stage. So this is this L shaped stage is a sample stage wherein we would be loading our samples. The samples could be wire bonded samples. The samples could be on wafer which we can probe using, I will show you the probe setup. So in this case, we have this packaged sample, which is held by a, uh, this, by a clip, so that it ensures that when the sample, when, when the stage is landed vertically, it does not fall off. We also have th this whole stage is actually conducting to ensure that the sample temperature matches with the temperature set by the temperature controller. We have multiple wires in place. First is the thermocouple wire which takes the temperature from the sample head. Second is the, these, these cables that you see 
convey the electrical signals for capacitance and current measurements to the device and that port is the port is not visible here I'll show you later so this is for the electrical biases similarly for the LED signals for the for biasing LEDs and connecting LEDs we use this port we connect the LEDs and we attach the LEDs here so how do we apply the biases for electrical bias we have this BNC port here which is which will be visible when the stage is put vertically for LED connections we have this BNC port here which would su supply power to the LED now to, to maintain chamber vacuum we have this valve which connects this to the turbo pump using a specialized uh, cable we have the temperature controller gauge connected here which controls the heating stage we have a thermocouple unit the thermocouple unit is connected here which gives the feedback to the temperature controller for efficient and stable control of temperature so before loading the sample I'll quickly show you how we can probe on wafer for on wafer measurements we use this positioners so this positioner has this screw for pulling for getting the probes down and hit the sample you can also rotate we attach the positioners the tip positioners here with screws and spring washers and then we can have a theta rotation along the point of uh, this screw and then we can slowly once we find the tips we can slowly land these this tungsten tips using these controls and so one more important aspect while we are probing smaller pads which are not visible to the naked eye is to use these microscopes so what we generally do is we put the stage we turn on the microscope light and using the eyes piece and by focusing we can do the focusing movements we can change the magnification and then we can land our probe tips for for on wafer measurements once our sample is probed we would we generally do a, an IV CV measurement that I will show you in the subsequent modules for the time being once we check that all the things are in place we would now put this stage back into this cryo holder and we would then seal, if, seal it off as shown in the subsequent steps okay so now we will demonstrate how to carefully load this sample holder stage into the cryo chamber one must ensure that while loading we should not touch the wired regions because there are delicate connections which might be hampered so as you can see we have to hold in this outer rim most importantly while loading in we must ensure that this L shaped sample stage does not hit the inner, cylind inner cylindrical walls because if it hits the inner walls then your probe might go out of the contact pads so we safely land this stage into the o-ring and then we change its orientation so that we can connect the turbo pump to achieve millitor range pressure so these are these accessories are for maintaining vacuum
So this is the key flange which is being connected. Once that is tightened, we now connect the turbo pump. Okay. Once this is the key flange is tightened, we'll put in the connections to the turbo pump as you can see by this specialized cables. The pipe is being connected using another flange. So few more things have to be connected before we start off with the measurements. First is this temperature controller gauge. Which has to be rotated in slowly. Next is the thermocouple sensor port. We have to check for the sign, so there is plus minus, we have to match the signs and then just plug it in. As I was pointing out that we have for supplying electrical signals to the device, we will connect it, connect these BNC cables to, to this to this port where D is written. D is for DUT. D stands for device under test. So we connect these cables to the source measure unit. We have connected these cables. For LED supply, we use a similar port with L written on it, just uh, opposite to this. And once this connection is done, we will check for IBCV measurements as I will show in the subsequent units. And once we get a good contact to the device, we will start going down to low pressures using as shown as we had connected these pipes to the turbo pump and will now switch on the turbo pump as can be seen here. Okay. So we'll turn on the turbo pump by pressing that button which turns on both the roughing and the turbo pump. We continue this until and unless the desired pressure is reached. Okay, before we move on to the next module for double pulse DLTS, current DLTS and optical DLTS, we must understand a few things that govern how good a DLTS signal is because this is going to be common for all the other modules also. So the first thing is to calculate the noise floor because if the noise floor is higher then any small signal which might arise from weak, uh, from deep traps might get uh, covered by that background noise. So one thing is to, how do we check noise floor is, we set the measurement voltage and the fill voltage as same value. Let us say we set both of them as minus 3.5. And for the measurement are the keeping all the other measurement conditions fixed. So we set all the, these voltages as same, keeping all the measurement conditions fixed. Keeping th this button in setup, it was in earlier in DLTS while taking the temperature scan, now it is in setup. And now we click on start measurement. You see that this number that popped up in the right hand side if I click it again, this number is showing the noise level in the transient, in the capacitance transient. So it is of the order of some, a few femtofarads, whereas our signals are in picofarads. So that would not hamper our actual measurement much. So our goal is to minimize this noise value by optimizing these parameters before starting a DLTS scan. 
what are the other parameters that might affect our measurement? One of them I have already discussed, I would repeat here, that is the leakage currents. The DLTS peak amplitude would significantly reduce when there is a leakage under the bias in which we are exciting the device because of the competition between the capture processes and the emission processes. The second factor that affects DLTS signal is the series resistance of the sample. So the series resistance might be contributed by the cable wires, by the probe tip or by the wires up to the contact of the device. So these affect the DLTS signal, it makes the signal weaker and in some cases it might even reverse the transient sign. We saw that the reversal was attributed to the type of traps but this reversal could be because of series resistance of the devices. So we have to be very careful in ensuring that the series resistance for a given capacitance range does not affect our measurement. So for that we have a special module. So we go back to this Semitrol program main menu, we go to the CV profile, we have something called capacitance calculator in which if we feed in the background concentration, diameter, directory constant, breakdown voltage, frequency of measurement, device di dimensions, applied bias, etc. It would give a, a range of series resistances which will not affect our device capacitance measurement. If the series resistance is quite high, then it would weaken our signal and may also cause reversal of sign. So this has to be taken into account. How do we also calculate series resistance? I will show you it in a, a later module. We do it by fitting the IV characteristics. From there we can calculate the series resistance when the device bias is towards the higher side. So by fitting in the forward bias regime, we can extract the series resistance because series resistance generally causes the IV characteristics to flatten, to saturate. What are the other factors that might affect? The other factor is incomplete trap filling. So I had discussed that we, we modulate the filling pulse width to get a bit good signal. Why do we do that? Because if the filling pulse width is very short, then the traps may not be able to capture all the carriers and they may not be saturated. We would want 100% filling of traps before we study the detrapping transients. So these are some key concerns for DLTS measurement, which will also be kept, which has to be kept in mind for the DDLTS and ODLTS measurements. Okay, so with the numbers, that we have extracted from the rate window analysis. We type in these numbers and we click on this plot simulation and RW data. So we see that there is, although there is a fit, but there is certain error in terms of the width of the signal. The white plot corresponds to simulation and the red and yellow plots correspond to the data and the smooth version. We can play with these numbers you see if I am increasing the temperature, uh, the energy level, the peak shifts rightwards, which is expected. Higher energy means higher temperature required to excite. If we want to fit the peak, it's around 363. Then let us change the capture cross section. We see the capture cross section changes the width. A lower capture cross section has a larger width and a shift towards higher temperature because a lower capture cross section would mean the field of influence corresponding to the trap is very narrow. So it cannot capture any, car any carrier passing by. Whereas if we increase the capture cross section, we get a sharper peak and the, and the temperature required shifts lower because we now the, a trap can now engulf any carrier with over a larger radius. Okay, so in an attempt to fit this peak, we cannot reduce this width. We will discuss how to do that. Also, there is another parameter which is NT by NS ratio. Since NS is considered as 1, so we are taking NT as that ratio number. If, it, if we change this number, let us say we make it 0, 0, 1 we see that lesser the trap concentration, weaker the signal is. Let us increase the trap concentration. 
the signal is strong. Let us increase it further. So, N T is one order lower than the background carrier concentration, the signal is very sharp. So, we see 0 0.01 or 0 0.02, 0 0.01 would be the best fit probably, yeah it fits the best. And we see one more thing that this fitting is not constant over all the temperature, all the time indices. So, to check for the error as to how much error is, how much fitting error is there, we have to click on this data, the subtraction, subtract data and we have to look for the amount of error. So, let us go down. So, this dotted line, the dashed line shows the error between data, raw data and simulated data. So, this would also be a guide for proper fitting of these parameters. Okay, so with this simulation process, we now go to the next module which is the fit transient module. We saw that although the data that has been extracted from the rate window analysis, it gives some information, but it may not be able to completely explain the data that we have obtained. So, we have to go a step further if we want to carry out a detailed analysis. So, that is fit transient module, wherein the whole of the transient is processed. Till now we were taking two samples using the rate window and we were just working on those two samples. The rate window analysis is very fast and therefore is commonly used for quick, for quick uh, access to the trap information. But for a detailed and accurate analysis, fit transient, fitting transient analysis is the best way. So, this module comes with multiple features. For example, you can see the first bar is stated as starting transient. So, we have a large scale of temperature over which we have data. So, we can select the temperature at which we want to see the data. We saw that we were getting a good signals at around 170 Kelvin. So, we have selected this bar in such a way that the, that 170 Kelvin falls it between this T min and T max regime. You see for this bar 40, setting this as 40, we have T min as 157, T max as 181. So, this is just the number of transients 0, 20, 40, 60. So, 40th transient starts from 157 Kelvin and 13 more transients added to that would go up to 181 Kelvin. So, we see 13 transients here. The next job would be to fit these transients for single exponential or multi exponential fit. So, for, for single exponential simulation, we can use multiple parameters such as ET1 which is the energy level of the trap, sigma1 is the capture cross section, NT by NS is the ratio of traps to the background concentration. We can play with these bars and we can visually watch as to how good these simulation data fits in. And once we get close to the experimental waveform, we can keep it at those numbers and then with these numbers we can define the initial conditions for multiple exponential fit if we want if we want these transients to be fit for more than two transients more than two exponentials or more than three exponentials then we have to select this from here number of exponential transients we want to fit and then click on fit fit and then to show the fit data we have to click on this include fit otherwise it will not show the fit result so, once we click on include fit, 
we get a fitting. I will show you by zooming into these transients. You see these dotted lines. This is the fitting transient generated by setting the initial conditions after, say, after varying the parameters that I have discussed. And I see there is quite a nice fit happen, has happened. You should be looking at these small dots. In fact, this has happened for all other transients. Let us zoom into another transient. Yeah, the fitting is pretty close for most of the cases with a very small error over a wide range of temperatures. Let me zoom out for a bigger picture. The big dashed lines are simulation data, simulation plots. If we want this process to be automatic, then we can click on the last button. We have to click on number of components that we would want to fit. Here I think three components would suffice. We can try with lesser, but if, if it is not able to converge, we will get an error message displayed here. So we tried with three components and if you click on fit, then this software runs through each and every transient, that is all the 211 transients, and then tries to generate the energy level, energy value and capture cross section. This is supposed to be far more accurate than that generated from the date window analysis. A similar fitting process is also done transient by transient using the last module where we click on fit all with all the number of transients that we have and then we get all the informations corresponding to the multiple exponentials. We can fit it by two exponentials and then we'll get information corresponding to each exponential corresponds to one kind of trap because we are we are take, we have modeled emission from a tap from an energy level as an exponential dependence with time so number of exponentials would mean number of traps contributing together and then we get a multi exponential curve so by fitting with this with more number of exponentials we can get information about distinct traps with this, we come to the end of DLTS data analysis, capacitive DLTS data analysis module, and then we'll move forward to the other modules such as double pulse DLTS, IDLTS, etc.